Kitco Mining Special Coverage of BMO's 33rd Global Metals Mining and Critical Minerals Conference is brought to you by First Majestic Silver. The top gold miner in Egypt is Sentiment, which plans to produce about half a billion gold ounces in 2024. Mark Horgan is the CEO. Martin, welcome back to Kitco. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad to be we here. We appreciate you doing this again because uh, we uh, did this at uh, the last BMO, but uh, you had uh, your um, year end that came out. Uh, you had some really good numbers in there. Martin, what would you like to highlight? Well, look, I think since uh, we saw you last year, quite a bit of progress right across the portfolio. Uh, at the Sukari mine in Egypt, we delivered guidance for the third year straight. Ounces came in uh, the bottom end, but on guidance, uh, and a really good cost uh, cost speed as well. We had a lower range of ASIC at 1250, but we came in at 1220. So, a great operational performance. Uh, and then on top of that, we released our new Life of Mine plan uh, back in October last year, and that really reestablishes Sukari uh, as to our mind a tier one asset. Ten years of life, uh, half a million ounces of production. Uh, and uh, positioning ourselves in the uh, lower half of the industry cost curve as well. So uh, after three years of uh, optimization work, delighted to get that out there. Very well received by the market and happy to see that. Uh, uh, staying in Egypt, we uh, had a very good year in terms of uh, working with the, the ministry in Egypt to help uh, finalize the new mining code within Egypt. Ourselves mm -hmm. and Barrick have spent a couple of years negotiating with government. Delighted to have shaken hands with the minister last July. Uh, and that new code now is going through parliament for ratification. And then finally in West Africa, uh, last year Soros announced our pre-feasibility study for the Dropo project in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. uh, first time the company's had reserves outside of Egypt, so delighted with that. Uh, a very positive study. Uh, and with that, we launched a full feasibility study in ESIA, which will be ready in the middle of this year. So uh, a really busy year since we've last seen you. I'm very happy to be here and talk about it. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, in, uh, Dropo was a, your um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire uh, project, right? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, leave, let's leave that for a second, then let's, uh, uh, let's uh, focus on uh, Middle East as well because we're talking off the camera as well too. There's been a lot of energy that has been going into the Middle East, especially what's happening with UAE and the investment in the resources as well too. Can you talk about how that might actually fit in with uh, what is happening at uh, Sentiment? Yeah, look, I think more broadly from a geological perspective, uh, obviously uh, the Arabian Nubian Shield, the geological package that sort of sits in the Middle East there, uh, you know, gold mining back to the times of the pharaohs. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. sort of two, 3,000 years of, of history of mining. So huge amounts of geological potential. Uh, hasn't really been explored in the modern period. Uh, we've seen sort of Saudi Arabia coming through, uh, uh, sort of, you know, Marden, the state mining company. It has a joint venture with Barrick around the, uh, uh, the Jabal Saeed mine. So Saudi has the, uh, lots of potential. Uh, Egypt, the Sukari mine that we have, you know, uh, uh, 5 million ounces produced to date, at least another 5 million ounces to go. Uh, really talks to the potential of, uh, of both of those. Uh, and I think there's a feeling now is that, that with that lack of exploration over the last 15, 20 years, that remains one of the last sort of great sort of untapped or unexplored geological terrains available. And I think then you overlay on top of that then the sort of improving political and security situation, ambition from both Egypt and Saudi to promote the sector. Uh, and I think we're seeing a, a, a real focus now coming on the region as, a, as the next potential jurisdiction for significant discovery, both in gold and base metals. Um, there was a push uh, by uh, Goldfields uh, that uh, tried to uh, take the Yamana project. Uh, and uh, part of that goal was actually kind of lift its profile in the uh, North American market. So um, talk about sentiment in terms of like, uh, in terms of its exposure and raising its profile in North America. Yeah, so look, historically, uh, sentiment used to be listed, well, listed on the TSX, uh, didn't move to London. Uh, so there is a legacy within sentiment of, of Canadian sort of markets exposure. Uh, look, I, I think for us uh, over the last sort of two to three years, we've focused on, you know, fully understanding the value of our portfolio, putting plans in place and delivering that. And so I think now with that sort of work largely behind us and the story to tell is that over the last sort of six to 12 months, we've really been looking to sort of spread the word effectively. Uh, obviously we're London listed, our, that's our home market. Uh, we've got Europe uh, on our doorstep as well through there, but I think increasingly getting exposure now to North American uh, uh, investors is something that we're focusing on. Uh, and still remains a really important source of capital for the business. Uh, at uh, Sentiment, you were, um, and the Sakari project rather, uh, you were doing uh, some uh, fleet expansion, so it sounds like you're doing uh, some capex on that, correct? Yeah, no, we've had a really heavy uh, reinvestment program the last three years. Um, uh, we've we, uh, accelerated the waste tripping in the open pit to give us more operational flexibility. Uh, we built a 30 megawatt solar plant that saves us $20 million a year and reduces decarb uh, uh, yeah. adds into our decarbonization program. We've swapped from contract mining to owner mining. We built a paste plant. We built uh, upgraded the underground ventilation. So a really significant sort of portion of, uh, of capital reinvestment into the mine. Uh, and I think for the last three years, investors have been very patient. We've obviously had reduced cash flows during this period while we've made this investment. 
But as we sit here today in 2024, uh, we've got our last major project, which is a connection to the, the national grid power there to further reduce our cost and de uh, decarbonisation strategy. Uh, and we're going to finish our waste tripping as well. So I think after three years of, of quite patient sort of uh, uh, support from investors, we're now on the cusp of being able to see ourselves getting full access to the cash flows that we generate after that significant reinvestment out of Sukari. Um, we were talking about uh, regions in Africa just before we had this discussion as well too. You are focused in uh, Egypt, fine jurisdiction to uh, operate in? Yeah, look, absolutely. Uh, look, I, I think geographically very easy to get to. Uh, you know, Cairo is a, is a, is a large, uh, a large mm -hmm. city, uh, ports, lots of infrastructure, roads, power. So I think, you know, uh, good access, good infrastructure within the country, uh, uh, easy ability to get about. 100 million people uh, living on about 5% of the land. So, you know, there's not, so in terms of sort of projects or in remote areas, you're not looking at big social issues. I think the thing that I've been really impressed with the last four years working there is just the quality of the Egyptian sort of workforce. Uh, high levels of tertiary education, uh, uh, the big oil and gas and construction industry, lots of skills available as well, and a real pool of talent there available in Egypt. So I think Egypt is one of the easier places I've worked in. I think, as we mentioned before, the, the, the country is going through reform of its mining sector, its regulatory regime. Uh, that tells you that the minister wants uh, the hard rock sector to develop. So you've got a pro-business uh, uh, administration that wants a mining sector as well. So you've got good geology that's underexplored, good infrastructure, good workforce, and a government that wants the mining sector. So if you're looking for places to go and work for us, I've worked in a lot more challenging places than Egypt. Uh, we were uh, talking uh, before also about uh, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, there is uh, uh, the Lundines that are coming in through it, uh, through uh, Montage Gold as well. You have uh, your Cote d'Ivoire project. Uh, bring us up to date. What is the focus there? So we're in, that's right, we're in Cote d'Ivoire, we're in the northeast of the country. Uh, that's a project that we did a scoping study on about three years ago. That led to that feasibility last year. Uh, and then we should have our, uh, sorry, pre-feasibility last year, should have our feasibility finished by the middle of this year permit applications, and then we're hopeful that we can make a financial investment decision around the end of this year as well. That's our kind of timeline. Uh, the project itself, I mean, Cote d'Ivoire, again, a bit like Egypt, fantastic geology, uh, uh, you know, very pro-mining uh, administration in place. Lots of mines are being developed and operated within Cote d'Ivoire. Good infrastructure, both roads and power, educated workforce, and lots of mining skills and supplies in country as well. So I think, you know, if you're looking at West Africa, I think Cote d'Ivoire remains probably, to my mind, the top jurisdiction of the places to go and operate. So when we think about the project location, very happy to be in Cote d'Ivoire. I think it's a good place to be. Uh, uh, and really for us now, it's about getting that work done uh, and getting to that financial investment decision. And I think when we think about project construction, we're also aware that both the equity and debt investors are also very comfortable from a country risk perspective as well. So I think it's, uh, it's a good place to be uh, along with Senegal, uh, uh, and possibly Ghana as some of the places you're going to be in West Africa. Um, I brought you brought up uh, the note uh, just regarding uh, spend because uh, that's been a theme that I see that's been uh, running through uh, the year ends that we've seen and there, there's been a lot of companies that have been uh, deciding to actually kind of uh, how would you say be cautious of their spending or actually uh, reducing spending as well too. What is the mood that you're hearing right now from uh, investors right now uh, when you're talking is it uh, uh, is it a growth or a don't growth or what they want to see you do it? Yeah, it's, I mean, capital allocation, uh, you know, it really is sort of the, uh, one of the key sort of topics we talk about at a board level. Uh, and I think, you know, as a sector, we've always got to remember that we, de we mine the ore bodies that we manage, we deplete them. Uh, uh, so you've always got to think about replacing uh, 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 those reserves. So you, there has to be that ongoing investment in the, the ore bodies that we operate. By the same token, I think investors are very happy to support those growth initiatives that will see the ounces increase or, or cost reduce uh, and have a good payback on them. And ultimately, if there's no growth available in the business, uh, then return to shareholders through so dividends. We, we have a standard, long-standing dividend policy. We've been a consistent payer since 2014, uh, or through share buybacks as well. So I think, I think rather than sort of investors looking at sort of growth or so on, I think they look very carefully now at capital allocation and, and how do we use those dollars that we generate to, to keep the business going, to grow the business, or if we can't see that, to return that to, to investors. 2019, uh, Endeavor uh, did take a run at uh, Sentiment, uh, which uh, did work out uh, for Endeavor. Um, stepping back more broadly, though, I mean, uh, you always hear that uh, they would like to see uh, more sector consolidation in the space right now. Uh, what's ahead do you see for m and in the gold space? Oh, look, I, I think, you know, for, uh, so I joined in 2020, so I miss all the fun and games of the Endeavor <laughs> run in 2019. I came in off the back end of that. That was all done and dusted, thankfully, before I joined. Yes. Um, no, look, look I, to me, human capital remains one of, the, uh, one of the key sort of like, you know, drivers of the sector. Having experienced, qualified teams, uh, I think is a, a, a rare sort of or a hard commodity to find for the sector. 
So I, I think that makes sense. I think scale, uh, uh, and so in terms of a portfolio, having a, a number of assets under management helps to sort of uh, uh, sort of smooth out lumps and bumps in production profiles or in political risk in different jurisdictions as well. I think there's a strong case for that. I think when you think about GNA amortized over a larger operating base, uh, well, you know, one management team can manage three or four mines as well. So I think there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of benefits to that sort of scale and diversification that comes with M&A. I think the M&A market right now, certainly we think about Africa, the Middle East and Europe as our sort of corridor of influence or interest, I should say. Um, I think the reality is that, that there's not a lot of quality out there. I think projects uh, uh, that we've been looking at opportunistically over the last couple of years, uh, trying to find things that, that sort of make sense, that are high quality projects, uh, that are executable and are real, uh, uh, that then have a sensible price tag when you're in a $2,000 gold price environment. So I think, I think the idea of m and is, is, is interesting. Uh, I think the ability to execute something that's actually value accretive is probably where the challenge comes from there as well. But look, we'll keep looking. I think it remains a theme within the sector. Uh, I think if people can get over the, dollar, the, the gold price and think about relative transaction, relative you know, value transactions, then I think it's a theme that could and should continue to, to, to dominate. Uh, is the uh, a theme or the focus of the business going to be you're going to be uh, Africa specialists? So we, we think about, uh, so I'm London based, so we yeah. think about sort of, you know, London, North, South, so we think Africa, Middle East and Europe. I'm so focused. We do, we do. <laughs> uh, and, look, and, and, and quite frankly, I've never really worked in South America, so we're likely to go to the Americas. Mm-hmm. Uh, it stands in Russia, somewhat obviously uh, off yeah, limits yeah, right yeah. now. So that leaves us a pretty big paper round in terms of that geography. Within that sort of corridor, if you like, we, we have a traffic light system. So uh, certainly red zones, uh, Mali and Burkina, for example, would be quite challenging for us to go. We, we're not going to go there. Other countries uh, would be an amber where we, for the right project, would take some more political risk. And then we've got our greens that, you know, uh, Egypt, Cote d'Ivoire, Saudi Arabia, for example, who'd be very happy and very comfortable to go there and operate. So, so when we think about our geography, we think about our traffic lights, we then think about projects, sort of quality and scale, is that very quickly you start to narrow down the available pool of sort of mm-hmm. opportunity to us. Uh, but we're going to keep looking and see where we go. Uh, we should mention the news dropped around the time about uh, Asinos uh, getting the uh, purchase as well too, which is uh, providing obviously uh, some needed boost to the sector. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, quite, quite an eye-catching transaction actually, yes. for a number of reasons. And uh, I don't know, Haya personally has, has been at that project for some time. Uh, uh, look, uh, delighted that, uh, that you know, the outcome for him and the team there, they've done some great work in Namibia. Uh, I think very interesting that the sort of, you know, as I understand it from the market, that Dundee were, were obviously announced as a preferred bidder with a break fee. Uh, and then this uh, all cash offer, uh, quite a substantial premium came over the top as well. So I think some really interesting sort of uh, lessons to take away from that uh, and about where sort of capital and appetite for the sector within Africa sits right now as well. And maybe we're seeing a shift east uh, from west as part of that transaction evidence. Uh, lastly, Martin, uh, milestones are next 12 months. Get that grid connection in place at Sukari so we can benefit from a, a pretty substantial uh, OPEX savings. Continue to build out our production profile back towards that 500,000 ounces. Uh, so maintain that consistency and start really getting back into those strong cash flows. Push the ropo towards our feasibility and investment decision. Uh, focus on delivery to make sure we, we're benefiting from those stronger cash flows. Uh, and really look forward to the future as to where we can take this business now that we've reset it. Martin, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Lecrae here at uh, the BMO conference in Hollywood, Florida for Kitco Mining. Kitco Mining special coverage of BMO's 33rd Global Metals Mining and Critical Minerals Conference is brought to you by First Majestic Silver.